Okay, everybody, if you would bow with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you for being always with us. Thank you for bringing us together in fellowship to study your word. Thank you for your word, and may it enlighten us and encourage us and guide us throughout our days. Tonight, I'd like to particularly raise up Cloyce. Um, he's been having bad days recently, and uh, we don't know what your plan is, uh, but we pray for his uh, his strength and uh, and his well-being, Lord. We also pray for Kaylee, who has been released from the hospital, um, and we pray that uh, that whatever she needs, that uh, that she will get. And if there's anything that the doctors or any of us can do for her, please guide us to that and help us to help her and help her to help herself. I suppose more than anything else, Lord, we pray that Kaylee will open herself up to to you and, and come to you full fully. Help us to share in your word tonight, Lord, and, and may we uh, uh, open ourselves to it and learn from it and support each other with it. In your son's holy name we pray. Amen. So, hi again, everybody. Good, good evening, Mike and, and uh, Sandy. Good to see you guys here. So, um, tonight we'll be doing Chapter 9, but like we usually do, I'll do a quick recap of Chapter 8, which we did last week. Uh, so the basic highlights I had from last week is to do your best to live like Christ, to be like Christ. Um, if we are in Christ, fulfillment of the law will be in us also, just like Christ. Uh, we talked about the concept of not being able to please God if we are in the flesh. Um, separation from God versus eternal is how many define hell. And the opposite of salvation, um, uh, it is, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, salvation is the eternal relationship with God. So, if we are in Christ, then our sinful nature becomes dead to us. doesn't mean we're not sinners anymore. Um, we're ransomed through the sacrifice of Christ's only begotten Son. If we're in Christ and we share with him, we share in his suffering, we share in his resurrection, we share in his glory. The great I am, the creator and Lord of all the universe, the omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent God of everything, deems us his heirs. An amazing, amazing gift. The glory of God and the amazing gift of salvation is so much greater than the sufferings and travails of this life. Our expectation of salvation is not as one owed, but was one who was given a promise that is assured by the most faithful and trustworthy source in the universe, God himself. God even answers prayers that are not prayed by us. Um, God is with us, but we need to surrender to his wisdom and power. And finally, beware the devil, but even more so, beware our earthly desires and self-centeredness. Okay, so if you all would turn to uh, chapter 9 in your Bibles, and I'm going to read uh, as I usually do, and you guys read along with me, and then we'll, we'll go through it. Truth I say in Christ, I lie not, my conscience bearing testimony with me in the Holy Spirit, that I have great grief and unceasing pain in my heart. For I was wishing, I myself, to be anathema from the Christ, for my brethren, my kindred, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, who in the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the law giving and the service and the promises, whose are the fathers, and of whom is the Christ, according to the flesh, who is over all, God blessed to the ages, amen. And it is not possible that the word of God has failed, for not all who are of Israel are, the, are these Israel, nor because they are seed of Abraham are all children. But in Isaac shall I seed be called to thee. That is, the children of the flesh, these are not children of God, but the children of the promise are reckoned for seed. For the word of promise is this, According to this time I will come, and thou shalt be to Sarah a son. And not only so, but also Rebekah, having conceived by one, Isaac our father. For they, being not born yet, neither having done anything good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to choice, might remain, not of works, but of he who is calling. It was said to her, The greater shall serve the less. According as it has been written, Jacob I did love, and Esau I did hate. What then shall we say? Unrighteousness is with God? Let it not be. For to Moses he said, I will do kindness to whom I do kindness, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then, not of whom, uh, I'm sorry, so then, not of him who is willing, nor of him who is running, but of God who is doing kindness. For the writing says to Pharaoh, For this thing I did raise thee up, 
that I might show in thee my power, and that my name might be declared in all the land. So then, to whom he willeth, he give, does kindness, and to whom he willeth, he does harden. Thou wilt say then to me, Why yet does he find fault? For his counsel has been re resisted. Nay, but, O man, who art thou that art answering again to God? Shall the thing form say to him who did form it? Why me didst thou make thus? Has not the potter authority over the clay out of the same lump to make one vessel to honor and the other one to dishonor? And if God, willing to show the wrath and to make known his power, did endure in much long suffering vessels of wrath rid, uh, fitted for destruction, and that he might make known for the riches of his glory on vessels of kindness, that he before prepared for the glory, whom he did call us, not only of Jews, but also out of nations. So also in Hosea he said, I will call what is not my people, my people, and her, not beloved, beloved. And it shall be in the place where it was said to them, Ye are not my people, there they shall be called sons of the living God. And Isaiah does cry concerning Israel. If the number of sons of Israel may be as the sands of the sea, the remnant shall be saved. For a matter he is finishing and is cutting short in righteousness, because a matter cut short with the Lord, uh, I'm sorry, because a matter cut short will the Lord do upon the land. And according as Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Seboa did leave us to a seed, as Sodom he may become, and as Gomorrah we had been made like. What then shall we say? The nations who are not pursuing righteousness did attain to righteousness, and the righteousness that is of faith. And Israel, putting a law of righteousness at a law of righteousness, did not arrive. Wherefore? Because, not by faith, but by works of law. For they did stumble at the stone of stumbling. According it has been written, Lo, I place in Sion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and every one who is believing thereon shall, be, shall not be ashamed. Okay, so let's start back up the top, and let's go through verses 1 through 5. Truth I say in Christ, I lie not, my conscience bearing testimony with me in the Holy Spirit, that I might have great and unceasing pain in my heart. For I was wishing I myself to be anathema from the Christ. For my brethren, my kindred, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, whose is the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the law-giving and the service and the promises? Whose are the fathers, and of whom is the Christ? According to the flesh, who is over all. God, blessed to the ages. Amen. Okay, so presumably God, Paul is uh, basically saying that he would rather be cursed and separated from Christ than to have so many of the Hebrews not believe in Christ. Why does Paul say this and feel this? Aren't they responsible for their own belief or unbelief? Yeah, Mike. On the most uh, probably simplistic level, um, any any parent who has strong affection and love for their children would would give up their own life for the life of their child in a heartbeat, and would would give anything for their children, especially if they are unfaithful, to turn back to faith, even though that child has his own will and his own determination to choose his or her own path um, that doesn't make the parent feel any less with his heart's desire to see them come back to God and I feel that's what Paul is sensing here sure they have their own ability to make their own choices but by no means is Paul saying you made you made your bed you lie in it he loves them <laughs> they want to do for them to come back Yes, yes, very good. Yes, thank you. So taking that thought to, to today, okay, beyond just Hebrews who don't believe, um, is that also a message to us then about how we should feel about those who don't believe? Don't, don't you think that also applies to us? I, um, I mean, Paul has, has certain strong paternal feelings and all that, but I think that willingness for us to um, well, that, that feeling that we should be willing to, to want to help people come to Christ should always be there for all of us. Okay, very good. All right, so let's go to verses 6 through, no, um, six through 9. I'm sorry, Richard, did you want to say something, or were you just scratching your ear? No, well, I was going to say, I guess that 
probably a goal that we should work towards is to hurt as badly for the unsaved as Paul was uh, saying here. And, you know, and, and that's difficult. You know, I mean, we have our lives, we have everything going on. And, uh, you know, that's just a very difficult concept to, the concept is, is there, we understand it, putting it into practice is a whole other thing. Yes, yes, yes. Words are easy, actions are hard, right? <laughs> yes. All right, verses six through nine. And it is not possible that the word of God has failed, for not all who are of Israel are those Israel, nor because they are seed of Abraham are they children. But in Isaac shall a seed be called to thee, that is, the child of the flesh. These are not children of God, but the children of the promise are reckoned for seed. And the word of promise is this, according to the time I will come, and there shall be called to Sarah a son. What is Paul telling us here? Yeah, Dan. It's not God's fault. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's part of it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, is he talking, is he saying, go ahead. Okay. Um, Okay, so from the Hebrew perspective, not all the claimed descendancy from Abraham are God's chosen. That's part of what he's saying, right? In that they, um, if they're not obedient to God, specifically following Christ, they are not part of what uh, they knew as the chosen people. On the other side of the coin, from the Gentiles' perspective, if you choose to follow Christ, the promise, as he puts it, you are one of the children of God. So essentially, belief in Jesus and obedience to God, not earthly birth lineage, are the keys to being in a relationship with God, to being a child of God. Once again, God's way of looking at things is not necessarily a human way of looking at things and vice versa, right? Um, so I think he's largely telling the, he's got two audiences here, right? Most of the people he's talking to are probably Hebrew, Hebrews. Some of them are Gentiles, and he's talking to both of them, really. David? Yes. Um, this passage uh, brings to mind, um, I, I was at a, a lecture once, and the, uh, the woman mentioned that her son, uh, who was in the military, said he would never raise arms against Israel. And if our country did, you know, he would be going against that. Um, and a lot of people do feel very strongly about that. And um, as a nation, you know, Israel is considered one of our allies. Um, I think a lot of people get it confused um, and equate Israel with, with um, you know, the, the chosen. And I... I mean, I, I don't want to get too far into political areas right now, but this clearly says they're not the same. Yes, and that part is, is definitely fair game for our study tonight, right? Yes, yeah, so um, I would agree. You know, there are lots of reasons uh, why people would, could, should, wouldn't, couldn't, you know, uh, uh, take military action against this person, that person, that group, that other group. But, um, yeah, it's, it would be incorrect, I would agree, that, to confuse the nation of Israel with the people of God, okay? Um, on more than one occasion, God has chosen that the, that the nation of Israel was, was going to, you know, fall and crumble and, and be punished, okay? So um, not that that's our job, but a yeah, good point, Jeannie. All right, so let's go to verses 10 through 13. And not only so, but also Rebekah, having conceived by one, Isaac, our father, for they not being born yet, neither having done anything good or evil, that the purpose of God according to choice might remain, not of works, but of him who is calling. It was said to her, the greater shall serve the less. According as has been written, Jacob I did love, and Esau I did hate. Now first I want to dispel um, any misconception around the phrase, and Esau I did hate. Um, although the exact phrase varies significantly in different translations, the vast majority of translations do have that word hate, 
Okay. However, in the context of the Hebrews of the time that this was written, this phrase probably meant to love less, not to hate, as we would put it in our vernacular today. Okay. So, um, so a couple of quick um, questions, uh, and then we'll have a discussion. So, who was the firstborn, Esau or Jacob? Esau. 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 So, according to Hebrew custom, who was the primary heir? Esau. Esau. Okay. Esau. Who were the twelve tribes of Israel descended from? Esau or Jacob? Jacob. 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 <laughs> okay. <laughs> so much like Ishmael and, and Isaac and then Esau and Jacob, the Hebrews' own claim of chosen people, uh, descendants of Abraham, is not through the firstborn, which is, of course, their custom, right? So why does Paul remind us of the message to, to Rebecca, the greater shall serve the less? Sort of Jesus is Esau. Yes, first of all, it's a very Christian concept, isn't it? However, beyond that, remember who, who's he talking to here? He's talking to Hebrews, and he's particularly pointing right now to Hebrews who probably don't believe, okay? Um, so he's driving, is he possibly driving home the point that God can lift people up from lowly positions to positions of importance and influence in his plan? But it's up to him, not our rules. Okay. Um, I would also true. Out, yeah. I would also put out there that we're not a, in a position to assume God's blessings. We're not in a position to presume God's lack of blessings on others. God's plan and God's ways are beyond our comprehension. And frankly, they're His call, not ours. Right. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, uh, I think this is part of what he's telling them, but he's also is telling them, like, you know, look, God can raise people up. Yeah, Dan. I think he's also telling us that. Yeah. I'm sorry, you broke up there, Dan. What'd you say? When God does that, he has a purpose. It's a certain purpose. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a good point. Yes, yes, yes. I don't think he was capricious in, in um, putting Jacob over Esau. He had a purpose. Very much so. Yes. All right, so then let's go to verses 14 through 18. What then shall we say? Unrighteousness is with God? Let it not be. For to Moses he said, I will do kindness to whom I do kindness, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then, not of him who is willing, nor of him who is running, but of God who is doing kindness. For the writing said to Pharaoh, For this very thing I did raise thee up, that I might show in thee my power, and that my name might be declared in all the land. So then, to whom he willeth, he doth kindness, and to whom he willeth, he doth harden. So, is Paul saying that God is capricious in how he deals with us? <laughs> Mike says saying back and forth. Yeah, Troy. Uh, no, he's not capricious, but he is sovereign, and he his his um his are above our understanding, uh, and we just have to understand. Uh, you know, who's a eyes question? So who who is judging capriciousness? Well, we're not equipped to do that. We don't have the, the wherewithal to do so. Yes, so we don't have the facts. We don't have his wisdom. We don't have his purview. We have none of the above, right? That's right. And I think also um, part of what Paul is focusing on here is the fact that God will show compassion in places where we might not have expected him to and where we might not have wanted him to. All right. Um, but that he's going to show compassion where he sees fit. And going back to Dan's point, um, particularly if it if it furthers his plan. Right. With the individual, with the broader, you know, us and then beyond. Right. All right. So let's take the example of Pharaoh. Was his initial inclination to believe God and or Moses? No. No. Right. No. Um, he was pretty much already set against God. He was already set against Moses for sure, right? Because we viewed as a a uh, personal 
threat, right, and, and competitor. Um, so God hardened his heart to hold out longer against Moses' positions uh, than he would have, but he was already hardened against Moses, right? Um, uh, God did this to highlight his power and his supremacy, right? So based on this, do you think it is God's basic way that he would force a believer into unbelief to make his point? Never. Never. Yeah, right. Um, yeah. Um, that does not yeah, appear. I, as far as I know. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Troy. And then Mary. I'm sorry. As far as I know, I don't think we've ever seen an example of that. Exactly. Exactly. Yes, Mary, go ahead. Uh, but for many years, I'm glad you all are saying this because for many, for years, I had, I struggled with that, um, that phrase there, but God hardened Pharaoh's heart. I used to ask the question, but why would he harden his heart if you know, and he knows, but then the more I uh, studied, the more I understood that, like you said, he had already had this proclivity to, towards, um, God, you know, uh, the, the, and God give us a free will, you know, to believe what, you know, whatever, we, whatsoever we choose to believe or who we decide we're going to be on. So it took a long time for me to get to that point. Yes, it takes, yes, well, you know, it takes us all a long time to get to a lot of points, right, Mary? Um, <laughs> that's why we do this in part, right? Because you, you go over the same scripture many times and finally certain bells start to go off and lights start to shine and yeah, very good. David. Yes, Jack. You know, I think this is a prime example, the, the example of Pharaoh, that probably one, the closest thing to the unforgivable sin is the hardening of your heart. For those individuals that have allowed themselves to become so set in their ways and their hearts so hardened that they can't accept and embrace Christ in our day, much like Pharaoh then, no matter what God was going to do to him, his heart was so hardened. And I just think that is a sin that we want to avoid at all costs, because I think it's the pathway to hell. Yeah. Yeah, and, and to follow up on that point, Jack, thank you. That's a great point. Um, it strikes me that if there's person A, who doesn't believe, but they're struggling to figure it out. And then it's the person who refuses to hear it. It's like, you know, no, I'm, I'm, you know, my heart is rock and you're not going to get in. I'd rather be person A. <laughs> yeah, Troy and then Mike. Yeah, um, that's a very good, good, uh, Brother Watts was a very good uh, uh, point. Uh, and the reason why I say that is because um, what can our heart can harden our hearts, even as Christians, to turn us away from God, is when we take a, a, a lax view of sin and we say something like, oh, well, God can forgive this. Well, yes, he can. But every time you do something, every time you sin, it hardens your heart is what it does. And eventually you end up in a place where you, you know, it, it, it turns you away from God and set himself. And so that's that kind of hardening of our heart doesn't just happen. We let it happen. Um, we we cause it to happen in some sense and we let it happen anyway. FYI, that's a warning um, regarding sin. It, it hardens our heart. Amen, brother. Yeah, Mike. Uh, first of all, Troy just gave us the Troy Revised Version of James 1, 13 through 15, uh, perfectly. <laughs> that's exact. I mean, that that's spot on. Um, one of the incredible things about God's nature and his character is that when he can, when he can know a heart, Pharaoh's heart is so hardened that he's, he's not turning back. God can still use Pharaoh in his hardness of heart to accomplish his sovereign purposes. That, that, is, that is a sovereign God that is uh, almost beyond my ability to comprehend. Amen. Okay. 
Anything else on those points? Good discussion, by the way. It's great. Okay, let's go to 19 through 21. That will say then to me, why yet does he find fault for his counsel who has resisted? Nay, but, O oh man, who art thou that art answering again to God? Shall the thing formed say to him who did form it, why me didst thou make thus? Hath not the potter authority over the clay out of the same lump to make the one vessel to honor and the other to dishonor? So what false doctrine or concept is Paul challenging here? Uh, if, if God is sovereign, you know, I'm under no responsibility or obligation to do anything. Yes, this is, this is the devil made me do it thing in reverse, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. So, is God all powerful? Yes, right. But uh, then, what's wrong with the doctrine? And and Mary brought it up before. It's the free will, right? Yes, He could make us do anything He wants, but He's not going to make us. He's not going to make us be faithful or obedient to Him, right? That's a choice that we have, and we have that on a day by day, minute by minute basis, right? Oh, that was that was done. No. All right, so let's do. Um, this is a pretty good block here, twenty-two through twenty-nine here. And if God, willing to show the wrath and to make known His power, did endure in much long suffering vessels of wrath filled for destruction, and that He might make known the riches of His glory on vessels of kindness that He before prepared for glory, whom also He did call us, not only out of Jews but also out of nations. Who also in Hosea, he said, I will call what is not my people, my people, and her not beloved, beloved. And it shall be in the place where it was said to them, Ye are not my people, there they shall be called the sons of the living God. And Isaiah does call, does cry concerning Israel, If the number of the sons of Israel may be as the sands of the sea, the remnant shall be saved. For matter he is finishing and is cutting short in righteousness, because the matter cut short will the Lord do upon the land. And according as Isaiah said before, except the Lord of uh, Seboah did uh, lead us lead to us a seed, a seed, as Sodom we had become, and as Gomorrah we have made been made, been made like. Sorry for stepping on that. Okay, note that almost all translations use the word beloved in verse 25. Um, the actual meaning here is often taken to mean preferred. I'm not sure that makes a, a significant difference here, but um, I think either of those will work. Um, so rather than capricious behavior, how is Paul showing God to behave? Yeah, Mike. Great intentionality to reach out to all. Um, his plan from the very beginning was to make Abraham the father of many nations. Uh, through his seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed, not just one nation. And his plan has been ultimately fulfilled in Christ. But it's just Paul saying, look, this is what God was up to the whole time. I like that. Good. Good. Yes. Anybody bottom else? Line, bottom line, God is not a racist. I, I would say that's a fact. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, you know, I can't even imagine that, that God perceives things in that context, right? Uh, that, that's a wholly human concept, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so some words that I wrote down here, by the way, were patient, long-suffering, uh, and and then willing to work with us and help us get into relationship with him. Um, that speaks to the intentionality that, that Mike spoke, which I love. I love that word, by the way. Um, yeah, Troy. Yeah, I heard a preacher preaching the other day. He made a good point, I thought, is that really biblical race and, and all – fall under the same you know the, you, we fall under the same laws the, the same principles and we should have, are all subject to the gospel you know so, i'm gonna throw that out there yeah i thought it was a good point 
Yes, it is. It is a very good point, particularly these days when there seems to be so much angst about what should be a fairly obvious point, right? Okay, let's finish it up here. Um, let's do verses 30 through 33. What then shall we say? That nations who are not pursuing righteousness attain to righteousness, and righteousness that is of faith? And Israel pursuing the law of righteousness, and the law of righteousness did not arrive? Wherefore? Because not by faith, but as by works of law, for they did stumble at the stone of stumbling. According as it was written, Lo, a place in Sion, I'm sorry, Lo, I place in Sion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and everyone who is believing thereon shall not be ashamed. So what familiar theme is Paul expressing here? Righteousness obtained by faith. Yeah, not the law, right, exactly. Um, he's made that point, I think, in almost every chapter, if not every chapter so far, and he's making it once again. Um, and those who, who pursue righteousness through the law are bound to what? Stumble, right? I like that. I like that, that phraseology. Um, and, and, to, and to fail. Okay, so... Well, uh, he brings out... A... Go ahead, so, go ahead, Troy. Uh, he brings out a messianic prophecy from Isaiah, and he, he, he says that I, I, I lay a stone in Zion that causes men to stumble, and the rock that makes them fall, and the one who trusts in him will never be put in shame. Um, he's, 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 of course, he's talking about Christ there. Yes, yes. That's right all much. I had. Okay, okay. Yes, yes. Yeah, and by the way, you may have noticed that um, Paul did uh, a lot of referring back to Old Testament in this uh, this chapter. He does that from time to time. We're, we're very familiar with him doing that, but he seemed to do it a lot here. Um, first of all, there's a lot of Old Testament on the concepts that are raised, right? Um, but again, he's talking to Hebrews who are, um, he's trying to bring into the fold. Yeah, Troy, go ahead. Yeah, whenever Paul went to a new synagogue, and that's all he had to preach from was the Old Testament. That was his, that was his gospel. He preached Jesus from the Old Testament. And he used scriptures like this one. Sure, because if he has a clear command of the scriptures that they're so familiar with, right, um, it gives him a certain credibility, gives him a, a, a stature, um, and, and he can then rightfully extend from there to the predictions, the, the prophecies of Christ, right? Okay. So some of the points we hit tonight are each individual is responsible for their response to the word. Uh, however, we should want everyone to come to Christ, right? Um, believing in Jesus and obedience to God, um, not earthly uh, birth lineages are the keys to being in a relationship with God and to be considered a child of God. Once again, God's way of looking at things is not the human way of looking at things. God can lift up the lowly to positions of importance and influence in his plan. Uh, and by the way, we didn't really talk about this, but the importance and influence in his plan might be almost invisible to us, right? I mean, someone who God makes very important in his plan, I might never even know of, right? I mean, I know about Paul, you know about Paul, but I'm, I can't imagine the myriad people who were very important in this plan to date who I know nothing about, right? Uh, we're not in a position to assume God's blessings, nor are we in a position to presume God's lack of blessings on others. Um, God's plan in our ways are, diff are you know, in comprehension or frankly not his. Um, and God will often have compassion where we don't expect it. Um, God can and does favor who he chooses, but God is merciful, kind, and faithful to those that believe and are obedient. And then last but not least, righteousness is through faith, not the law. And those who pursue righteousness through the law are bound to stumble and fail. Um, and that's a you know, pretty... You know, opposite sides of the uh, uh, of the coin, right? It's like you're either doing one or the other. And I, and I realize as humans, we tend to do a little bit of mixture, right? <laughs> it's, it's easy to, to be following Christ and then still find ourselves wrapping ourselves in legalisms and, and stuff that we don't, you know, that don't really, don't really matter. Um, 
But those are opposite directions in our faith. All right, any other thoughts on the chapter that we just read? Anything that we didn't cover that you want to cover? Oh, uh, yeah, Dan. Really, chapter 9 was set up for chapter 10. Paul is trying to convince Israel that the law will not save them. And that's where he goes next. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. So to that end, come back here, tune in next week. <laughs> chapter um, yeah, that's right. Yeah, um, I wanted to mention this. I don't know if Mike Johnson did at the beginning. I came in a little bit late, but um, a good announcement. Um, Sarah, who was one of Daddy's, uh, my dad's caregivers has decided to be baptized and uh it's going to be tomorrow night at 7 30 at the church building so anyone who wants to come out is welcome to come uh and we'll probably have it on hopefully we'll have it on zoom and and uh, mike will send out a link but i just thought it would be a good thing to announce uh it's been a while since we had a baptism and you know despite covid god is still working so anyway and i I told Mike, I said, I considered this to be part of my dad's legacy. Amen. Because he had the influence on her. Troy, did you say Sarah? Sarah, yes. Sarah. Oh, that's great. Right. And, and, Amen. and she, she uh, had a lot of cynicism at first. So she's come she a long did. way. She did. Yeah. Yes, yeah, she has. Absolutely. That's she wonderful. Did. She has. She's. She's come a long way. Has she been right, attending? You want to say something? Oh, oh! I was just going to um, give every, everyone a heads up that we'll actually um, be uh, uh, broadcasting. I guess the best word would be broadcasting the baptism tomorrow night on our YouTube channel. So if you just go to mandarincc.com and and click on the sermons link and click on wherever it says live. Um, you'll be able to, to watch with us. Uh, so um, we hope if you can that you'll uh, join in 7.30 tomorrow night and um, wonderful, wonderful thing. And um, a reminder to all of us that when somebody, when a guest is sitting amongst us and we wonder if anything is registering or not, um, they may shock you just like Sarah uh, mentioned to Troy three weeks ago when about baptism, so we we never know what God is doing, and all glory to Him. Yeah, Amen. Right. right. Amen. Yes, Mike, just, I, just, Mike, I thought it, I thought it was interesting today, Mike, that the uh, police officer who was there at the building uh, sat in the back for the entire sermon and in the auditorium. Wonderful. Which is kind of unusual. Hmm. That I think that's the first time. We've had someone take that much interest to hear what's going on. Yeah. Very cool. Very good. Uh, by the way, and then tell me if I'm wrong, Mike, but I just want to make it clear to everyone. Basically, you're going to do it just like you do Sunday morning sermon if you do it, um, if you if you watch live stream. It's the same. You go to the same place, do the same thing. It's just going to be exactly. different. <laughs> yeah, so that's wonderful. Looking forward to it. Anything else tonight before we close out in prayer? I just want to say Mike's done such a good job. I, I was thinking that this morning during your um, sermon, just how very blessed our congregation has been. Yeah. Amen to that. I agree, Gene. Thank you. And right. David, before you close out, Richard, is this the week y'all go to Atlanta? Uh, yes, we leave on uh, Thursday. Okay. We'll, we'll be gone Thursday, but should be back Monday night or Tuesday. Okay. Y'all have a safe trip then. Yes, yeah, safe trip. that too, David. Remember that. Is the baby doing well? I I'll let the proud grandmother answer that. <laughs> <laughs> he is already back up uh, well beyond his birth weight. He lost a few ounces and... Now he's well above that, so he's doing just fine. 
Amen. Good. That's great. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you. All right, everybody, if you'd all bow in prayer with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for blessing us tonight with your presence and with the presence of our brothers and sisters together tonight. Thank you for the new um, lives in, in, in our lives. Thank you for Sarah as she approaches your throne to become a follower of Christ. And thank you for the new Dossi grandchild and that everybody is healthy. Thank you for all the blessings that you provide us, Lord. May we take your word, we, we take your energy and your light and spread it throughout the world, Lord, way beyond what we believe that we can do because we have you behind us and in us, Lord. In your son's holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Love you all. Thank you, David. Love you all. Yeah. Thanks.